WNYC-TV presents Barbara Lee Diamondstein and... Hi, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest today is Jamaka Highwater, a Native American Indian who bridges the gap, lives in the space between Western and non-Western lifestyles. I guess you do that all the while you try to preserve Native American culture, as you have in one of your books, Song from the Earth. And on the other hand, you live so deeply in Western culture as the music editor of the Soho News. Right. <laughs> in both of your incarnations, a very warm welcome to you, Jamaka. Thank you. Thank you. You've been on a crusade for some time now to make Indian art more visible and more accessible. That's true. How do you propose to do that and with what success have you met? Well, I mean, I'm doing it in the only way that I know how, by writing about it, since I'm a writer and uh, who's Indian, and, uh, and by talking about it, um, uh, by lecturing and um, doing things like what we're doing here today. Um, I guess I, it's hard for me to appraise the success of it, but my books, you know, have done well. And, um, They've been picked up by, by what's, what's nicest to me is that they're used by Native American studies programs in universities across the country. There are almost a hundred universities that now have Native American studies programs. I really meant something beyond really your books oh, and please. your work, but the Indian art itself that you are so committed to and so concerned with. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has gained greater, a larger audience and greater acceptability as an art form? Um, not in the um, not in the very closed um, art world that has its its own sort of perception and its own notion of where it's coming from and where it's going. Um, not in the way, say, that African art has made a very strong impact. Most artists I know have an African piece or two and so on, admire it. But in New York, um, I always tell the story that in the Southwest, people always say. Uh, to an Indian, gee, um, what tribe are you from? And in California, people always say, gee, you're an Indian, aren't you? And in, in New, New York, York, people always say, you're not an Indian, aren't you? <laughs> and what does that mean? That means that... That regional that, differences in taste? <laughs> I think it, regionally, we simply are invisible in New York City. I think uh, many New Yorkers sort of think that an Indian almost has to be a put-on, that we're su that there were our terminal people, that after all, we're, we're, we don't exist anymore, or we exist somewhere well, on the roadside. Maybe there's a more positive aspect of that, that mm -hmm. New Yorkers think that there is a place for everyone in New York. Well, I think that's more generous than I would be about it. I really think, in talking with other Native Americans about this, that we really don't have visibility in this city, which is the capital of media, which, and that concerns me. Um, and I can tell you this because many of us, from the artist and friend Fritz Scholder, mm -hmm. uh, my own work, uh, R.C. Gorman's work, mm -hmm. um, I could go on and on. And it's really difficult um, for our publishers, our representatives, depending on what we do. It was more difficult. It's getting a little easier. It was very difficult to get us on television shows, to get us interviews. Once you got um, west of Chicago, they, you know, they fell all over themselves. Well, how uh, do you explain that? Because Indians simply are not visible. They are not... Too remote from the New York experience? I, the mu we don't New have, York experience... How many Indians are there in New York State? Perhaps about 10,000. Let's do something semantic for sure. a moment. In our several minutes of conversation, we have both used interchangeably the terms Indians, and Native Americans. Right. Well, they're both wrong, Barbara Lee. You realize that uh, America is the name of a very nice Italian gentleman who just, you know, and um, uh, Indians uh, are a reference to a people who live on the other side of the globe. Columbus didn't know where he was. We did. And um, it isn't what we call ourselves. And so it, though some of the more militant Indians today are concerned with what we are to be called, as women are concerned with that idea, and blacks have been concerned with it. And I think it's an important consideration. For me, um, 
uh, whether we call Which preference do you prefer? I don't have a preference. Reference I really do don't have a preference. As a writer, I try to find as many, an uh, as, in any, as many synonyms for the word as possible, since I use it a mm -hmm. great deal. And, How did you uh, become a spokesman for Native Americans? I don't know that I am a spokesperson for Native I'm. I have a feeling that I, I simply, uh, I mean, that I speak for myself, just as you probably feel that you really express your own ideas and feelings about the art world. I too uh, am not appointed nor feel assigned. I am certainly not the Henry Kissinger of Indians. On the other hand, um, there are some of us, few of us, who because of the fact that we sort of broke certain taboos and, and, and made certain efforts that were unusual at the time, went ahead and into the, the Anglo, as we refer to the white world, the Anglo world of, of education and so on, and became a little bit more articulate in both cultures, and therefore tr felt um, the need to, to say something about our people to the world at large. Uh, we're, we're separatists. I think what you know. I'm really thinking of mm -hmm. is when I said uh, to you earlier, what is the perception of other Native Americans to you and your work, your reference to the term taboos, I was really thinking in terms of Indian philosophy in, and as contrasted to the Western, the Anglo uh -huh. sense of achievement. Is that in conflict? Um, not anymore. It used to be. The main, the main thing, the main conflict that existed was that when my generation, even the prior generation, when the Scott Mamaday generation, mm -hmm. um, and it goes even further back the, to people like Charles Eastman at the turn of the century. But when people went off to the university, it was essentially to be assimilated. It was essentially to pass. And our people became very concerned about this because it meant that they were literally seeing us disappear into the other culture. So that it, getting an education, therefore, wasn't considered a, a, an advantage. It was considered tribally a disadvantage. Also, I think it's terribly important to indicate that Indians have their own education, you see. You don't have to go to a university. I mean, as I've often said, when I was graduated, I'm told by the scholarship uh, uh, fund uh, that's uh, located in, uh, headquartered in San Francisco, I was told by them, by their uh, prior director, um, Dean Chavers, that I was one of 40 PhDs who were Indian. And some people always say, oh, isn't that terrible, isn't that sad? And I always say, well, not really. I mean, after all, how many Anglos have ever spent four years at a reservation becoming a, a holy man, you know, or a holy person? Uh, we have our own educational process, but I, there are some of us, and this, there are increasing numbers, who are interested in the educational institutions of the other world, of the Anglo world. And so um, as Japanese uh, people will come here, or Japanese Americans will go into universities, uh, that doesn't mean that they don't within their own nation, within their own country or their own culture have an educational process too. And I think that's terribly important. People always think that Indians, if they don't go to the in university, somehow are ignorant, somehow are illiterate. Um, but it's really an yeah. Anglo standard as to the, oh, of course. Uh, the value of education in general, not restricted to helping Indians, but helping everybody. Right. Well, I speak out of the Indian experience, so, and, and you of course it's a metaphor of a larger black idea. Foot Black feet. feet. Yes, yes. Black feet, Cherokee parentage. That's right. You were born in Montana. That's right. Lived in California. Part of my life, yes. Now spend part of your life in New York. That's right. In Zurich. That's in right. Turkey. You are the most mobile of any. Well, I come from a nomadic people, so that explains it. In any case, while you were in New York, that you have been appointed to be the consultant to the New York State Council on the Arts. I assume, for Indian affairs. Essentially, yes. What do you do in that capacity? I visit um, various cultural programs concerned with um, Native Americans. Um, there's a very large population, as we said, um, I mean 10,000 or more. Northern um, New York State? Well, and in, in Manhattan, too. There's an American Indian community house right here on East 38th Street off Fifth Avenue, which has its own gallery and You should tell programs. them the address. It's 10 it's, East 38th no, Street. Yeah, that's right, number 10, East 38th Street. You're right. And it has a gallery on the ground floor that's very effective and so on. And, and for a while, I was the president of the Cultural Council of that organization. Um, and I'm very enthused by their work. And, but I also go upstate to St. Regis and the other reservations and other communities, because there are many Indian communities that are not re reservations, and try to help um, advise the State Arts Council special program uh, 
in ways that it can more effectively fund Native American projects in the arts. Have you instituted any programs in that Well, kind? I mean, my main effort, I think, has been at the Cultural, uh, at the um, Cultural Council of the American Indian Community House, where, where we did, it, we are the founding members of that particular organization and uh, uh, of that particular wing of the organization, the cultural part of it. And so that was sort of um, breaking ground, but also everywhere that I have gone in New York, all the projects are very new and, and, um, um, and require, I guess, a kind of attitude that is not very accessible in New York. I mean, you have to judge Indians by their own standards and by in terms of what's going on in, in Santa Fe and what's going on in, in uh, in the north uh, east and uh, northwest and so on. It's, then are um, you saying that Anglo viewers should look at Indian art in a and a, assign to it a standard other than they do to Western art? I, I think that eventually that's true of all art, isn't it? Don't you have to look at um, in, uh, abstract expressionist painting much differently from the way you look at impressionist painting? Don't, isn't really finally what art really but is quality about in seeing, the end isn't it? is the standard. Right. I think, in fact, it's one of the things that you touched on before, and that was that until recently, and I think there is, however imperceptible it is to you, may I? Sure, of course. A slight shift in emphasis right. in terms of Indian art. I think that. Uh, I guess African art, up until the last 30 years, was viewed on an ethnological rather than an aesthetic basis. That has been a very dramatic shift. Uh, and I begin to see the same thing occurring it with is. Native it American is. art. You have brought to us several examples of traditional art, That's the right. roots of painting. The antecedents of painting, yes. And yeah. perhaps we should begin by Talk. talking sure. about some of these things. I'm thinking of this splendid bowl from Acoma, New yes. Mexico. Right. Can you tell us, besides being decorative, what the aesthetic Well, it is not basis. decorative. In well, fact, then, that's the first error, if you'll forgive me. Because you see, the Western view, view would be that this is decorative. Many, uh, I, when I was sent over by the New York Times to cover Sacred Circles, 2,000 years of, of American Indian art, mm -hmm. when I was at the Hayward Gallery. Um, In London. In London, mm -hmm. right. I mentioned, I mentioned in the piece that I did that people kept saying, oh, it's so decorative, everything is so covered with time. But I indicated that it's not decorative, at least not in the sense that roses are used to, um, to cover a teacup, in my opinion, to disguise the fact that it is, in fact, a teacup. But in this case, well, what is that these, surface? These, these, uh, Tell us. these surfaces are, give, are imprinted on this, on this, on this particular um, vessel and give it a significance, an identity, no less um, uh, clear than uh, the identity of a fox or of a tree or of a person. This pot is a being, and in the Carlos Castaneda sense, it's filled with um, a power, a kind of aesthetic power. Uh, you see, in the Indian world, the aesthetic ideal is pervasive. It isn't a kind of aristocratic overlay. It isn't something that is done in spare time. It isn't something that one must acquire um, knowledge about in terms of a special elite or uh, have particular uh, f abundant funds available in order to participate in it. It's a pervasive thing that any, any traditional Indian could look at this pot and say, give some value, say, it's oh well, a good pot or a it's bad a good pot, pot. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's a bad pot, or, you know. Um, they, in fact, in my language, there's no word for art, but there are 11 words for shades of yellow. We are an aesthetic people. We are a people, like all primal people, whose first principle is not beauty, but expression, you know. So this pot isn't, has expressive power, and it's not decorative. Now, I don't mean to suggest, as many people did for years, that everything about Indian art is is symbolic. So of its own iconography. Of that's, the iconography is much more ambiguous than that. Um, Can you tell us something about the pot that you're holding? It's made in Akama. Um, pottery is essentially made by women and decorated by women as a traditional idea, although this is not um, as adamant as it was in the past. There is no better or worse connected with this uh, sexual division of labor. It's simply tradition. Women essentially always work in abstract geometric forms, and men work more often in pictorial forms, in narrative forms. This pot from Akama and this basket from, uh, this papago basket from, um, from uh, southern Arizona 
And there, the Papago and Pima are probably, uh, other than the California tribes, the very, the masters of basketry. Is this around Tucson? And this is south of Tucson, well, that's right, but it's that area. And it, if you see, geomet the geometric ideas are similar. And um, though you can always find rain motifs and cloud motifs in these sedentary agricultural people for whom these elements of nature were tremendously important, what I'm really trying to say is that what is on the surface of these objects is as specifically part of their character and being as is our nose or our mouths or our eyes, which we couldn't call decorative. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that they are functional. I am simply saying they are identifiable part of the being of these, of these objects. In which medium do you think Indian art is most expressive? You brought us pottery, basketry, and beadwork. I think they're, yeah. I think, uh, they're expressive in, in all of these forms. Uh, Barbara Lee, I think that all of them, uh, like the media and Western art, all of them uh, um, are able to fulfill a different expressive, they are able to support a different expressive content, um, but, uh, the, the, but all of, and all of them have different points of view. Th this, by the way, is the way so-called beadwork started out in the Americas. This is a um, is porcupine quill. Uh, they're the quills of porcupines which are boiled and soaked and um, then colored, split, and sewn on to sinew. Later, the Czechoslovakians introduced beads to the Americas, mm -hmm. um, obviously uh, after, sometime glass after Columbus. Yes. Right? And these glass beads mm -hmm. became very popular, and you'll see in early, the early transition, you'll see, for instance, at the Museum of the American Indian mm -hmm. at 155th Street mm -hmm. and Broadway, you'll see pipe bags in which this quill work mm -hmm. is still used, but beadwork is also mm -hmm. used on it. And then gradually, the beadwork begins to take over more and more and more, and then you'll see the French influence of floral patterns begin to arrive, where really you can possibly call that work perhaps more decorative in a way, because... Well, it's it, my know. assumption that this beadwork is older than the beadwork that you are holding. That's right, yes. Right. And I have determined that not because I know anything about Indian art, and I do not, um, but because of the color of the beads. That's right. And I might also say that I find this one more pleasing in color than the one you're holding, which right. leads me to a question yes. that obviously concerns you, as it does, you know, many others. And that is, that is there, now that there is a wider acceptance of Indian art and Indian artifacts, there is, of course, always the danger of commercialism. Yes, for all well, artists. Yes, of course. <laughs> on the one too. hand, the one hand that the very thing that you would like to achieve, a wider audience for your work, sometimes serves to dilute that work. It's true. How dangerous is this whole aura, and yeah. how much of an incursion has commercialism made with Indian art? Well, let me. Let and me a, gra a great deal. I mean, it's the same problem, though, um, in all with for all artists. Here, I don't think there's any racial difference. The only difference is is that everybody assumes that Indians. Uh, are born, come out of the womb, uh, making pottery, and that we know everything about being Indian the moment we're born. And of course, that's crazy. Um, and people assume that if you're Indian, you therefore are an authority on things Indian, and that's not true either. Um, but um, so many people feel that if you have a, an Indian or a person who looks Indian at the side of the road holding up some sort of trinket, that obviously this is the real thing, and it isn't the real thing, um, necessarily. It could be. Um, today, more and more of the really great craftsmen and artists are, and there's really no difference in the Indian world between the craftsmen and artists, but are really working out of studios, mm. and, and their works, obviously, you pay, you pay for their greatness, right? Whereas but to what extent great, are their works affected by Western culture well, and Western great, demands? The great artists, some of them are, I can see moments of decline in them. I, I like to talk about the painters because I keep up with their work mm -hmm. a, much more constantly. And in some of the painters, I begin to see in, in things like uh, American Indie Arts Magazine or Arts in America and these publications, I begin to see in the ads I'm talking about a definite decline, especially in this, this churning out of lithographs for middle class mantelpieces. But that you find everywhere. Uh, Non-Indians are doing the same thing. These limited editions are reaching the point where they are making art accessible to everybody, but I have the feeling often that the art that is finally arriving in the homes are somehow a compromise, you know. Um, well, you've said in the past that uh, too much or too little is made about Indians, yes. of Indians. Yes. Can the same thing be said of their art? Yes, uh, yes, of course. 
um, I think that it's very important for us to just recognize it, recognize it, its distinctions and what it is, but at the same time recognize that it has its failings and it has its amateurs and it has its, uh, its rip-off artists like everybody else does. Can you tell us about this Kiwa sure. um, figure? There were, um, there were a number of, um, of young men in, the, in Oklahoma, uh, they're Kiowa, um, who um, began to paint. And Stephen Mapope, who did this, this uh, work, is one of them. This is, this is a reproduction, by the way, not an mm -hmm. original. But they were done on illustration board, generally, and, or on paper, uh, colored paper in the, in the Southwest. And they are essentially watercolor work. Um, they were self-taught in their own tradition, in other words. Uh, but this idea sprang out of a long history. It's related to some of these other things. Mm -hmm. But Maybe it really show us some comes out of, let me show you what it comes out of. It comes out of the work of some um, artists, about 72 young Indians were required to go to prison in Fort Marion, St. Augustine, Florida. What is the date of that? 1875, and they spent three years in prison. And um, they, de they invented what is called ledger art, and this is an example of it. This is a work of Zautum, one of the one of the 72, and amazingly enough, a great many of them turned out to be marvelous artists, but there's a long tradition of it, as I said. Indians had been painting their history on skins and uh, For 2,000 years. Yes, what are the earliest years. known examples? Well, most of them, because of the materials are very perishable, are post-Christian, in mm -hmm. other words, uh, in, the, in the Christian era, so to speak. But the rock art and some of the early Kiva murals uh, mm -hmm. extend even further back. When these young men came home to Oklahoma, um, they, w people realized that, gee, they had sold these ledger books that they had done with crayons. They're called ledger books because they were done in, in ledger books. They were given commissary books and ledger books, much as you would give ch them to children because Indians were always considered sort of children's and wards of the state at that time, uh, either marvelous savages or noble savages, one of the two. But, and th but what they filled these books with was something that was not childish art at all. It turned out to be nostalgic art. It turned out to be an expression of their great sorrow in being taken away from their people. And um, so when they went back, you see, to, to Oklahoma and to that area, other artists who are much younger said, gee, there are, or not artists, but mm -hmm. young men said, gee, there, people will buy our work. People will pay attention to us. So the Kiowa Five, or the Kiowa Boys as they're called, and actually there was a girl among them, Louis, uh, Louise Smokey, were given the right uh, through the efforts of Oscar Jacobson, the head of the art department at the University of Oklahoma at that time. It's about, um, I guess, in about 1918, 1920, somewhere I may be off a few years. Uh, where they were given permission to become special students there, mainly to be able to experiment with materials and to try to find their own way. They were not terribly influenced by Western ideas and so on. And Is all, Western yes. civilization so remote from tribal society? Are we really so different? Yes. In fact, I give great emphasis to this. In this we're living in a day and age where there's great emphasis on how similar we are. And I think it's a drastic mistake. I think we're similar in very few ways. In the world that's described by biologists and physicists, those fundamental ways, cellular ways in which we are the same, are so few that I think we learn much more by dealing with our differences, by our similarities. It's a very unfashionable viewpoint. But I think people like to overlook the fact that races and national groups do form stereotypes and generally do have temperamental differences. And I think these enrich us. And I think that in, we should emphasize those things rather than be so self-conscious about them. I don't think you have to be the same in order to be equal. And I think somehow equality and, and uniformity have been confused. I don't think democracy belongs in biology or in the arts. I think it belongs in politics. And God knows it isn't there. It isn't in the Indian world. It's not found there very often. We were talking about the merits of some of these works aesthetically. If there is such a difference, can Anglos really comprehend, understand, appreciate the art of the Native American? Sure, why not? I mean, first of all, it can be judged by Western standards, um, uh, just as Japanese art and Japanese poetry. But some poetry. Japanese think it is uh, impossible, and the risk, and forgive me, I do not mean yes. to be impudent, yes. but in one of the things that you have written, I think you said once, in fact you implied, yeah. that it's almost impossible for a non-Indian to really understand Indian painting. But you've also said yes. 
that even most Indians don't understand in their painting tradition. Yes, well, so me, if neither Anglos right. nor Indians understand yes. it, I, I think who does understand right. it? I think you've misunderstood that a bit. Well, then perhaps you might clarify. Right, because um, what I said is that fundamentally it is as difficult for non-Indians to understand the Indian world as it is for men to understand women or the experience of being women or for non-blacks to understand the experience of being black. I think we've reached a time where we want to know what women think about being women and what blacks think about being blacks, and I think it's high time we find out what Indians think about being Indian. And this goes beyond these races. Um, obviously, I cannot write a book like Saul Bellow or, or Phil, uh, Philip Roth. Um, the Jewish experience is also something that I can only grasp as an outsider, but that doesn't mean that it's, I can't grasp it on some level. On the other hand, Indians in their own culture, as I said, are very, you know, and they would say, this, that's a pretty good pottery, mm -hmm. and it's only pretty good. It's not a great one. How do you but use... But let, let me Sorry. finish, if I may. On the other hand, when they go into Anglo culture, then they are an existing in a highly stratified culture where the intellect is, high, is, 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 is stratified from relative naivete to high degree of sophistication. So that in Acoma Pueblo you will see a beautiful old pot filled with plastic flowers. Mm -hmm. This is simply to say that the Indian may not, when he finds his way into Anglo society, may find his way into the world of the blue collar worker or the white collar worker. So, Indian painting is largely, when you deal with the most contemporary example of Indian painting, like the work of, say, Fritz Scholder, who's probably, or, or mm -hmm. the late Yiffy Kimball, a very great the Fritz painter. Is, the Fritz Shoulder is here. Great ground, yes. And Yiffy Kimball, who just passed away just recently, and I, I certainly lament her passing. Um, uh, when you deal with these two artists, you're dealing with something which is highly influenced by Western ideas. And many Indians, therefore, Themselves think of Fritz think Shoulder's of, yes. work as being grotesque and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, one doesn't go to every Spanish farmer or um, politician or to engineer to evaluate the, Picasso, the, uh, yeah. the work of Picasso. Exactly. To them, it may be How grotesque. How do museums, but, however, treat Indian art? Well, and how many museums? there are a great many yeah. museums that in, in Song from the Earth, I list a number of them that do have good collections. The Philbrook in, in Tulsa has one of the best. Um, the Southwest Museum in Los Angeles has a very Please good one. Please don't forget our museum in the American Indian and the in Ameri New York City. Of course, City. and the Museum and the of the American Indian. the remarkable international collection. Oh, it's great. And in fact, it's the greatest collection of Indian artifacts uh, and painting anywhere. It's the largest also, supposedly. So it, it, it's, and people, there are dealers here in New York that represent uh, Shoulder, and, the, and again, we lost a very great young painter at 32, was killed in an automobile accident recently, T.C. Cannon, uh, whom I greatly admire. And uh, so if you see the point I was making, there are two worlds in America. It may, it's one land, but two worlds. And Indians find the access to one as difficult as non-Indians find the access to the other. It's, we live between worlds, and the great adventure, of course, is trying to pass between them. Well, for helping us to bridge that gap, special thanks to you, Jamaka Highwater. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and thank you, audience, for being with us, too. <laughs>